Hello there, I'm Adrian Atkinson and this is Jamaica Magazine. In the show today, we journey down 79 Duke Street, where much of the changes to our constitution and political history took place. And later, Montego Bay Community College students showcase an app that calculates taxes and grade point average for students. Stick with us as we kickstart the Independence Weekend. <music> We have championed e-learning in Jamaica, provided state-of-the-art technology in over 200 educational institutions, developed materials for CSEC, piloted the Tablets in Schools project in 38 schools, including infant and primary, and trained thousands of teachers in technology integration. We are e-learning Jamaica Company Limited, EL Jam, an agency of the Ministry of Science, Energy, and Technology. Visit our website, www.elearnja.org. Good day, I'm Tamara McHale and this is your GIS News for Friday, August 5. The Jamaica Customs Agency has reported net revenue of $44.136 billion for the first quarter of the 2016-2017 financial year, surpassing its target by 5.2%. Chief Executive Officer Retired Major Richard Reese made the disclosure during a press briefing held at the agency's head office on Thursday. When compared to the first quarter of the financial year 2015-2016, the agency recorded growth in net revenue collection by 13% or approximately $5.120 billion. This being up from the $39.016 billion in 2015. He also noted that major tax items including import duty, GCT and special consumption tax performed positively relative to the targets for the quarter and previous year. Some 80 jobs have been created with the opening of a multi-packaging plant at Red Stripe. In lauding the move, Industry Minister Carl Samuda says this will lead to additional employment as the company engages more farmers to increase cassava production. A key ingredient in its processing, Red Stripe plans to have a thousand acres of cassava under production by the end of this year. I have participated in the growing of cassava. I am convinced that it is a wonderful project and I'm looking forward to the day when you achieve the expanded involvement of our Jamaican workers and young farmers in particular to be part of this wonderful experience. The minister was speaking Wednesday following a tour of the company's facilities. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Audrey Shaw, who was also on the tour, said Red Stripe's plan to bring its U.S. bear production operations to Jamaica and increase its export markets opens up a wealth of opportunities for entrepreneurs. I want to, 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 to thank Red Stripe and Heineken for the confidence that you are reposing in Jamaica by leading the way back to this kind of vertical integration, backward and forward. Backward into the farms and forward into the export markets. The production of Red Stripe Bear was moved to the United States in 2012 and returned this year. Persons who disobey evacuation orders may soon be prosecuted. Local Government Minister Desmond McKenzie made the disclosure at a press briefing on Tropical Storm Earl Wednesday. Minister McKenzie said he would be seeking to enforce the emergency evacuation regulations under the Disaster Risk Management Act. We have reached a stage now where we can continue any longer to put the lives of our first respondent at risk because persons continue to disobey the call for evacuation. $21 million has been pumped into the Western Regional Health Authority to help with its vector control efforts. The money from the Tourism Enhancement Fund covers the cost of nine fogging machines, a pickup truck, and the employment of additional resources in Westmoreland, Hanover, St. James, and Trelawney. Our partnership is in a broader base of securing Destination Jamaica, of making our people healthier, and creating an environment that will be conducive to healthy experiences for our visitors who come. Our effort must be to fight it and to show to the world that we are winning the battle. 
And finally, government has so far spent over $100 million to treat persons with acute flaccid paralysis, AFP, including Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS. With 81 notifications, only 10 cases are suspected to be cases of GBS, two of which have been confirmed as Zika positive. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton says each case of the condition cost the government $1.5 million to treat, which is free of cost to patients at public facilities. Dr. Tufton says the ministry has been stockpiling supplies to treat GBS and other Zika-related complications. The minister also stressed the importance of personal responsibility in detecting and destroying mosquito breeding sites. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Tamara McHale. Thank you for watching. Get your tickets early for the 2016 staging of Grand Gala at the National Stadium on August 6. Tickets will be available from Friday, July 29 at Tasty Crossroads and Tasty Portmore and from August 1 to 5 at Independence Village, Rani Williams Entertainment Center. Let's get together and feel all right. This building holds portions of our political history. It was the seat of the government and the office of the Colonial Secretariat from 1872 to 1960. Let's find out more about the place that is now the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. The Jamaica National Heritage Trust is more than just a building that houses artifacts. It's a symbol of our post- and pre-independence period. Also known as Headquarters House, the JNHT is just one of many buildings that tell the story of our rich history. It got the name because it was once the military headquarters of the War Office in 1814. The building was constructed in 1755 and was home of Thomas Hibbert. On November 12 that same year, the Legislative Assembly met there while Hibbert was acting as Speaker. It later became the seat of government and the office of the Colonial Secretariat from 1872 to 1960. The government of the day in 1872 decided to move the capital from Spanish Town into Kingston this became the center of governance. This is where the Legislative Council used to sit. And after 1944, this is where the beginning of governance by the Jamaican people, elected through universal adult suffrage, became the seat of governance. After 1944, we had a number of other constitutions which led us to self-government and ultimately to independence in 1962. So it was in this room that Bustamante and Manley and other great luminaries of the legislative period of governance from 1944 used to persuade their party members to vote in their favor. And as a result of a combined effort, we agreed to become independent and we negotiated with Britain for the purposes of independence on June the 6th, 1962. The size of the chamber would suggest that the number of government officials were few. As a result of independence in 1962, the government also decided that they needed a new building to hold a larger parliament. And that's why Gordon House was created next door. So that's the joining relationship between this legislative council building, which is now the headquarters of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, and Gordon House next door in which our parliament sits. It's a very exciting corner of Jamaica, a very exciting corner of Kingston. And of course, the political parties today, when they march to Gordon House, one party moves from Headquarters House, as it is still known as, and the other party moves from the northern side of Duke Street and comes together in the parliament. The cabinet room, or the room in which the government uh, ministers sat is upstairs is in fact the boardroom of the trustees of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust today 
The building is used for a variety of different purposes, which include the storage of artifacts, as well as the various departments of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. So it continues to be a very important building of history and heritage for our people. The fact that it was built in 1755 means that over these last 250 plus years, it has been subject to all sorts of natural disasters, including a fire next door, which nearly took it down. So hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, and other natural disasters, this building has been able to survive them all. Did you know that it was from this building on October 12, 1865, that Governor Edward John Eyre planned his attack against the St. Thomas Freedom Fighters? He declared martial law from this house on Friday, October 13. And it was also here that the right excellent George William Gordon was arrested in 1865 and taken to Marat Bay, where he was executed. I can't become the master of my destiny. Step up your stride, make we work like a harder. Do it like Veronica, more than a sofa. We can rise above the challenges and shine. Was with passion in your heart. Make a plan and stop all the hiding. You think I saw me reach out the edge? We live in a fast-paced, technological-driven society. Our mobile devices such as our cellular phones and tablets are ever-changing. So too are the applications. We now have apps for all types of games, procedures and services. Watch now as students from the Montego Bay Community College showcase their Jamcal application. comes from the second city of Montego Bay, where students from the Montego Bay Community College launched an app to calculate taxes and more. Plus, in the zone, Montego Bay Schools celebrates excellence in the performing arts. So stay with us as the package unfolds. What's the app? It's a calculator mobile application. It helps anyone to do various calculations. And it's available for now, it's available on Android. In the future, you will see it on more platforms. So we have a PAY tax calculator. We also have a GPA calculator. Sounds good. And this app called Jamcal was developed by Final Year Management Information System MIS students at the Montego Bay Community College in St. James. Lead developer Carlton Ellis explains. I decided that I would make a mobile application. And so one of the benefits of this is that what you install the app one time and you don't need internet to use the app. So you don't have to have data on your phone to use the app. You don't have to open a web browser. You get a native app that is powerful. It will, 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 will keep you in the know and give you the power to negotiate and be informed. Pretty cool. So if you're not a math brain or simply not up to calculating your taxes, Jamcal will do it for you. You select your pay period, enter your gross salary amount, and if you pay pension, the calculate button, there you go, information in the palm of your hand. And for you students, especially those in college, calculating your grade point average is as easy as 1, 2, 3, using Carlton's GPA calculator which forms part of the Jamcal app. You plug in a few 
information, the name of your course, the letter grade that you got, and of course, the credits. If, it, if, it, if, if the credits weren't different for different courses, you would need a TPA calculator. You could just add up everything and divide it. But the credits, the credits make a big difference. You click add. And every time you add a course, it automatically gives you the final GPA on the screen. It's praises, praises, and more praises all around. Today, we have JamCal, which I tell you, I strongly believe, is an app that will make a big difference, especially in the Jamaican landscape. I couldn't believe when I punched in the salary and the pay period that it actually calculated everything, you know, accurately. Um, it's wonderful. Support these students and their innovation by going to the Google Play Store and using the Jamcal app. Remember, once you download it, you do not need internet access to use it. Up next in the Zone News with Amaya filling in for Dominique. Hi and welcome to In The Zone News. I'm Amoya Vincent. Recently, schools in Montego Bay, which took part in the various Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, JCDC competitions, were awarded for their outstanding performances. Top schools included Herbert Morrison Technical High, Cornwall College, and the Montego Bay High School. Let's have a look at one of the winning pieces. from Montego Bay Shining. Keep up the great work, guys. Tune in next time for another edition of School Zone. I'm young, gifted, and balance-free. I will stand up for peace. No matter what you say, you can't take that away. I'm young, gifted, and violence free. I choose, I choose to live. live. I choose to be me. In 1943, he founded the Jamaica Labour Party, JLP, and in 1962, he became the first Prime Minister of Independent Jamaica. Have you guessed yet? Yes. This next feature will give you details on the life story of national hero, Sir Alexander Bustamante. Wow, this is really nice, Mrs. Strudwick. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. Good. We're standing in the dining room of the Bustamante Museum. So this is one of the rooms where Sir Alexander Bustamante no doubt spent many nights strategizing his next move as president of the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union, which actually gave birth to the Jamaica Labour Party. That's right. Sir Alexander Bustamante wanted better working conditions and increased wages for the working class. Here now is the story of the chief. Take a look. Well, let's go. Thank you. One of the great movers and shakers of Jamaica's development. A hero in the eyes of a nation, he worked hard to improve and protect from many injustices within his time. Alexander Bustamante knew what was required to improve the plight of the common man and tried to make that happen. What we need in this island is not more men, but more men with courage with the spirit of fighting for justice for all, and more so for the less fortunate, independent men who will sacrifice their own interests for their unfortunate sisters and brothers. His heroic life journey began in this small rural district of Blenheim in Hanover. Here, in this small cottage nestled in the cool hills, the son of Robert and Mary Clark was born. It was February 24, 1884. He was named William Alexander Clark. Mm -hmm. 
Young Alexander was among other young men who were forced to seek employment abroad when jobs in Jamaica proved scarce. He had changed his surname from Clark to Bustamante by the time he returned to Jamaica in 1933. It was after starting a money-lending business in Jamaica that he became fully aware of the harsh reality of poverty faced by most Jamaicans. Low wages, bad working conditions, um, people were not regarded as, as people, they were just factors of production. Bustamante chose to preoccupy himself with improving the prevailing conditions. He began with writing numerous letters to the Daily Gleaner and occasionally to British papers as a means of exposing the extremely bad social and economic conditions of the masses. He made it known that human beings were not supposed to work under conditions where the wages were so low that they were unable to feed themselves and to feed their children. By the time he was near his 50th year, Bustamante's advocacy had evolved, with him becoming an active mediator in workers' strikes. Something new was happening in Jamaica, in which he would play a central role. The poor and oppressed had passed the stage where they could be bullied into submission by the guns and bayonets of the then colonial forces. Bustamante's voice grew loud in support of the workers' struggles and in contempt of the governing authority. His speeches, mediating and organizing activities slowly replaced the people's disorganized resentment to the oppressive forces of the colonial government with organized resistance. The charismatic, influential speaker drew large crowds at union rallies and organized and supported numerous strikes. In May 1938, he founded the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union, BITU. He had grown into a strong political figure and began working with his cousin Norman Manley and others to form a new political movement, the People's National Party, PNP. At the same time, his clashes with the authorities continued and on September 8, 1940, Bustamante was detained at Up Park Camp for the alleged violation of the Defense of the Realm Act. He was released in 1942 and soon after successfully formed his own political body in the form of the Jamaica Labour Party in 1943. The next year, universal adult suffrage was instituted, allowing all Jamaicans the right to vote. In the December 1944 general election that followed, Bustamante's JLP won the majority of the 32 seats in the House of Representatives. Because of the great work he did as a trade unionist, it was not difficult for him to get the people together to vote for him. At his second victory at the polls in 1949, Bustamante became the unofficial government leader as Minister for Communication until the position of Chief Minister was created in 1953. In late 1953, Bustamante was honored by Britain's Queen with the title Knight Bachelor and was addressed Sir Bustamante. He was named Jamaica's first Prime Minister when the country gained independence from Britain in 1962. And later that year, married longtime associate and union colleague Gladys Longbridge. Sir William Alexander Bustamante received the Order of National Hero of Jamaica in 1969 for his immense contribution to Jamaica's politics and dedication to improving the conditions of workers. He died at the age of 93 on August 6, 1977. Numerous activities are planned each year for our independence and emancipation celebrations. And one of the most sought-after events is the renowned Mellow Go Round. If you missed it for some reason or the other, here's a taste of what took place.
We've come to the end of Jamaica Magazine for this Friday. Thanks for spending time with us. Remember to keep up to date with the latest government information. Join us online at gis.gov.jm or catch our programs on our YouTube channel. Be sure to check out our other social media platforms. You may also catch a new edition of Jamaica Magazine tomorrow on this very station. Until then, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Have yourselves a great evening. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.